Follow after that. And if you pick them one by one, and you make an effort, that's why we got started, that you strive, you make an effort, and you say, how much of righteousness do I have in my life? How much of godliness do I have in my life? How much of love do I have in my life? How much of faith, how much of patience or of meekness do I have? And you strive after that, and you pursue that with all your strength. And then it says in verse, in verse 12, fight the good fight of faith fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life whereon should thou art also called and as profess a good profession before many witnesses i pray god will help us and let's look at second timothy chapter 3 verse 5 second timothy chapter 3 we're looking at verse 5 having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof I mean, a form of godliness. There are people that have the outer shell of godliness. And that's why I spoke to you yesterday. Brothers and sisters, would you please look up? You know, sometimes, um, and as, as a deeper life uh, pastor, when I see that we are having the wrong kind of emphasis, and maybe we were guilty, those of us who are pastors, who are guilty for putting across that wrong kind of emphasis. And then we come back to correct it now. When we correct that kind of emphasis, there are some people, some of the members of our church, they hold on to that form of godliness. And they say no. In fact, they even some of them go to, and they become so bold and I would say so stubborn to say, even if then they mention my name, I, I think, uh, you know, that's going too far. Even if Pastor Kumayi comes here and tells me that, they tell their pastor, I will not do that. I think that's going too far. What am I talking about? I was talking about, you know, yesterday I mentioned about wearing scarf or wearing hat. And, you know, what if I came here and I dress in suit like this and I put the Yoruba Ibadan cap on it? That looks nice. What if I dress like this and I put the Igbo, that red cap, you understand, and put feather here? I think that will, that will look nice. You look very strange to the people. You'll not be able to evangelize. And Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And all we're saying is where they go. And therefore, if you come on here, and we're talking about, you know, your dress. You see the way the choir dressed this morning, the combined choir? And what if as they dress, you know, in the combined choir, instead of wearing the hat they wore, what if they wore the turban, the kind of thing you wear in Nigeria? It doesn't match. And then we who are your leaders who taught you the other one, we're telling you now this is the way to do it so that you'll be able to reach the community here. And some people will say, even if Pastor Kumoye comes here and tells me that I will not obey. What is the grace of what is the respect for leadership? Because it says obey them that have the rule over you. And we cannot even correct that minor thing. And to, you know, while all that scarf is there, there is animosity within. There is some forgiving spirit within. And there is malice within. And we cannot relate with our brother and sister. Which one is more serious? What, go, what is God to, God to, going to judge us with on the final day? Is he going to judge us on the scarf or on the malice? Look at the whole of the gospel according to St. Matthew. How much, how much emphasis is placed on dressing. Look at Mark. And look at John. Look at Luke. How much emphasis is placed on dressing, on cap or scarf. Look at the Acts of the Apostles. And look at the Romans. Read everything. 
And the only thing you can find is in First Timothy chapter 2 verse 9 and then First Peter chapter 3. Because of just those two verses, we leave the weightier matters of the Lord. The evangelism God has given us to do, we don't concentrate on that. This is the only thing we want to concentrate on. That's not godliness. The stubbornness is there. And the incorrigibility is there. And they will just hold on to that. Is the scarf going to take you to heaven? And all these other sisters who are wearing the cap, is that going to take us to hell? Why can't you? There's no, when there's no authority, there is no father figure, there is no pastor that can talk to us, and there's nobody that can say, sit right and shape up and do this and do this. And we cannot, even myself now, it's like I'm paralyzed. I'm, you know, kind of like, you know, incompetent to talk to the people that they, they say, they say to your face, let him come and tell us we will not do it. And then I say, now, where do we go from here? There's a deeper life we rest on. And if I, you know, if I go home to glory, you know, I was, uh, when I was in Abuja, one of the pastors was crying. He was praying. After I finished giving a particular message, he cried. He cried his heart out. He said, you know, we well, shouldn't thank God for anybody dying, but you know, you know how he prayed? He said, God, I thank you. That is his wife that died, that this man did not die. That what if instead of his wife dying, it is this man that had died. And then he will take all this wisdom and all this impartation. He'll take it to heaven and we are here. Another one said, how is it this man is just coming now? We've made so many mistakes in our church. And now this man is just coming out to set us right. The other fellow said, are you not even happy? He's living the deeper life in Lagos and is coming to us now. The outsiders, they are hungry. And they are saying, we are thanking God that he came. And then I come to my own people, the people I raised up. Many of you were born again in Nigeria. Either at the retreat or, you know, at a particular meeting that I held. You owe your spiritual life. You owe a lot of that to me. And now I come over here just because to move from Nigeria to America doesn't mean I'm not your father anymore. And then you have the effrontery and the boldness to say, even if Pastor Komoye says that, I will. Who are you? Between Moses and, you know, all those other people gathering man on the ground. Don't you see the distance between them? Paul the Apostle said, I, I shouldn't be boasting. I shouldn't be, you know, telling you who I am. But because you didn't recognize who I am, I have to tell you people that this is who I am. If I'm not a father to the rest of the people, am I not a father unto you? I think we need to change our language. And we need to change our attitude. You don't want me to come here and be subservient to you and become like a slave to you. That I then cannot have the boldness to tell you this is the right way to go. I think you need to encourage me to be bold and to say what I need to say so that we'll set everything right in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. If you want to clap, put your hands together. Amen. You know, this, this last time I went to Abuja, I, you know, I had another language. I told them, I'm, you know, fulfilling my promise. I promised them in Abuja. I said, anywhere I go now, I'll tell them what your people do. You know, I used to say, put your hands together. But, you know, they said, jab your hands together. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And those people really jabbed their hands together and something really happened. Now we're talking about uh, this, uh, this is a good way of sustained godliness. And I pray that the godliness will be sustained in our lives in Jesus' name. It talks about the people having a form of godliness and then denying the power thereof. It says, from such turn away. We're looking at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'm reading there to you from verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. In Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He has given it to us. Let's, let's seize it. Let's take it. Let's accept it. And I pray that it will profit us in Jesus' name. And he says, so the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. I pray God will do it in everyone. 
point number three, the glorious way of shining glory. The glorious way of shining glory. As the Lord is leading us through the gate and then through the way that leads unto life eternal, He wants us to understand that the reason why Jesus Christ died for us is so that He can bring us to glory. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. He wants to bring many, many, many sons unto glory. He'll take you there. I said he'll take you there. Hebrews chapter 2, we're looking at verse 10. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. In bringing many sons unto glory. The Lord wants us to go to glory. He wants us to get to glory, and we're going to get there. And it says at the latter part of that verse 10, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. How does that happen? How is he going to take us to glory? We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, not just some of us, we all, everyone making up his mind, saying, this is mine. The word of God is for everyone. And we all, it says in that verse 18, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. We behold his glory. We behold his majesty. And we behold his shining life. We behold his exemplary life. We are beholding the face of the Lord in glory. And then it says, we are changed ourselves into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It says, as we behold him, and we see his majesty, and we see his glory, we see his honor, we see his exaltation, and then we keep on looking at him as a master, a model, a savior, a lord, a king, and redeemer. It says that beholding our faith will also change us from glory to glory. Uh, we don't look at the things around. We don't look at the things we suffer. We don't look at the deprivations that may come. We just look at him and then the glory will come. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 16. For what? For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, walketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When you keep on looking at the Lord and you don't think about the things that surround you and the things that might look like a pressure upon the people of the world, it says, why well, we look not at the things which are seen? But are the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. We're looking at First Peter chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 4, verse 14. The glory that comes, even when you are persecuted, even when you are slandered, even when you have some challenges, yet the glory that comes, First Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If ye be reproached, insulted, abused, taking, taking advantage of. For the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part is evil spoken of. On your part is glorified. Our lives will glorify the Lord. Uh, what then do we do? What was the, uh, what's the art or the decision we ought to have? We're looking at Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, we are risen with Christ. We died with him, we are crucified with him, and we are buried with him in baptism, water baptism. And now he says we are risen with Christ. And if ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are where? Above. Put your emphasis there. Concentrate on that. Focus on that. And seek those things which are above. Seek spiritual things more than material things. Seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection where? On things above. Set your affection on things above. The community in which we live, the society in which we live, has a way of setting our affection on things below. 
And you need to make an effort and say, no, I'm not going to allow the condition of this place to make me just be looking down, looking at material things, possess this and have this and gain this and get this and acquire this, accumulate this. I just want to set my affection on things above. Set that affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is seed with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him where? In glory. I pray you'll be there. You know, if we'll take this gate and get into the narrow path, and then you channel your life and lead your life according to this word we're part today of saving grace and of sustained godliness and of shining glory. I pray that when that time will come and Christ will break open the heavens and then he'll come for his soon and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are left will be changed and then will go with the people. I pray you'll be there. When the saints go marching in. I will be there. I said, I will be there. I pray you'll be there in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up then and let's talk to the Lord and say, Lord, this is the way you are leading us. We've heard the word of God and the word of God does not offend us. The word of God does not uh, kind of uh, make us to be on edge. The word of God just uh, makes us to say, Lord, what I see not, teach thou me. If I've done anything wrong, said anything wrong. If I've gone in wrong direction, set me right. I'm willing. That's how to get to heaven. We don't get to heaven by struggling with God and struggling against God and fighting against this word, arguing against it and complaining our mind and saying, no, we'll not take that. It's the obedient people that get to heaven. You tell the Lord, Lord, I want to be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. The way of grace, the gateway, the gateway of saving grace, the gateway of saving grace. Let that grace be in your heart, be in your life. And if you've been hearing about this grace, the free provision of the Lord that leads us to life eternal, have you taken it to heart? Have you, have you accepted it? And are you telling the Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, do this for me? The grace that saves and the grace that sustains in that salvation. And the grace that keeps us sanctified, purified, holy and godly. The grace that makes us to deny all ungodliness. And the grace that sorts our heart. The grace that doesn't pick offense at the teaching of the word of God. The grace that is willing to turn around and be the kind of person, the kind of brother, the kind of sister, the kind of preacher, the kind of pastor, the kind of minister we ought to be. The grace that is willing to say, oh Lord, I know it's me. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of this grace. Let's tell the Lord the gateway of saving grace. That grace will bring meekness. That grace will bring humility. That grace will bring peace. That grace will bring good relationship. That grace will bring a soft in heart. That grace will bring obedience to the word of God. Grace. Grace. And don't turn that grace of God into lasciviousness. Don't turn the grace of God into self-centeredness, self-pleasing, self-will. The grace. The grace that comes upon our lives and turns us around, makes a change in our hearts, makes a change in our lives, makes a change in our relationship, makes a change between husband and wife, between parents and children, between members of the church and the, and the ministers in the church. The grace that gives us that meekness and that love and that forgiving spirit that changes the character, that changes the conduct.